Well, good morning once again. This morning we want to continue with our study in Ephesians. You know, it's, it's been a blessing for myself to be able to work through this book and to be challenged in the different, different ways I've looked at different doctrines throughout the scriptures, the depth that I've even understood about certain passages. And, you know, if, if Ephesians chapter 1 wasn't overwhelming enough for me, Ephesians chapter 2 is not over, overwhelming, but it, it really packs a punch to it as it describes who we are and that which God has done on our behalf. Um, last week we really focused on those first two words, but God. And we really outlined all that, that details and all that that directs us to, and we could have gone on and on in each one of those other categories, looking at the greatness of what those words testify to us, that great interjection of God. This morning we want to continue with chapter 2 and continue with verse 4 moving into verse 6 looking at the wonderful exposure of God himself that which those words but God really testify towards it's in these verses that we see some of the attributes of God in regards to the atonement in regards to our salvation that which is applied towards us for God's glory and I think sometimes we forget that little aspect that God's acting on our behalf wasn't just necessarily for our benefit alone, although we, we receive benefit and blessing out of that, but it was to bring glory and honor to His name. Um, the aseity of God does not allow for any need within God, and so God is not looking for something that He's somehow missing or something that He somehow desires so much that He must have, and in order to have that, He must correct the course of action of humanity, and in that correction, He finally gets that which He's been missing. That is not at all what we're talking about here, but rather just focusing on the greatness of who God is and his great, wonderful character. And as we see his glory exemplified in this passage, the beauty and the depth of the truth that is shone into our hearts. And you know, when we think about great characters, when we think about great individuals who have acted on the behalf of others, there are great stories that we hear, and there are great maybe personal stories that we're very much aware of, maybe with, even within our own family as we look back generationally as those who have intervened in, in critical and crucial circumstances on the behalf of others to change their circumstances or who have sacrificed themselves for the betterment of humanity. Now, there are many great events that we can learn in school. There are many great books that have been written in regards to these, many great biographies, many great movies that portray these heroic acts of bravery, of kindness, of sacrifice. In fact, we even have a prize that is handed out to certain individuals who would qualify for these sort of selfless acts. We call it the Nobel Peace Prize. It's been awarded 101 times since its beginning, starting first with Jean-Henri Dumont, who started uh, the Red Cross. He was the first recipient in 1901 of the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1986, Eli Wiesel, for his work in educating about the Holocaust and reconciliation with that horrific act to his life and his family. And there's many, many others who have received this, this sought after or this, this prize that reflects what they have done on behalf of humanity. And there's many other things that the world deems to be peaceful contributions for the betterment of humanity and it is here in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're conflicted with the greatest of all acts towards humanity. Qualifying in fact God eternally as if he wasn't qualified before, but God eternally for this Nobel Peace Prize on his act towards the benefit of humanity, the eternal benefit of humanity to those who would accept Christ. And it's to him alone that the glory is deserved by such an act. And it is this act that causes all those other heroic acts that we look at in all of history to just kind of pale in comparison when we think about what God has done for us. 
we truly serve and have indisputably so great a God. And so open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 and let us read the first six verses. And you were dead according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we commit this time to you here this morning, the study of your word, I just pray that uh, you would open our eyes and our hearts to the greatness of your character, that which is revealed through your word. That as we reflect upon, as we hone in on to these descriptions of a glimpse of your greatness, that we would be moved, that we would be challenged, that we would be motivated to live our lives in accordance to so great a God and so great an act on our behalf. May everything we do reflect your purpose. May we steward the gifts that you have given us well. And may all we do and say bring honor to your holy name. Be with us here this morning as we look at this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now this goes without saying that this is indeed a wonderful passage. And I'm sure many of you have reflected on this passage in the past and have come to the same kind of conclusion when you read those magnificent words, but God. But this morning here we want to look specifically at verses 4 to 6 and investigate some of the depth in which we find here within these verses. That which ultimately should stimulate within us a right response and understanding. <coughs> and I got a little bit of a tickle in my throat, so I might have to take a few swigs of water here and there. Verse 4, as we said, starts off with those words, but God. But when we move past those words, it's really in this opening verse that the text really presents these aspects of who God is going past not just this great or grand interjection on our behalf, but declaring the significance and resulting effects of that great interjection in our life of all the things that we talked about. I mean, the text does say, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And in these verses from four to six, ultimately we're presented with three definitions of God's character. The first is he is rich in mercy, a declaration, a definitive declaration about God. Not only is he rich in mercy, but he has this great love that this mercy results from. And then the overarching aspect of God's grace. These three areas in these verses from 4 to 6 are presented emphatically to us and grace is exposed even further as we work down into the... Grace and mercy are benefited towards us from God by his love. Look at what the text says. God being rich in mercy because of, because of his great love. And in verse 5 it says, by grace you have been saved. All of these things are resulting of this love of God that has been bestowed upon humanity, calling his children to him, making it even possible for his children to come to him. Because of his really translated as resulting from or realized to us through. We would not know these things about God if he did not first extend himself to us. And the efficacy of this realization is a guaranteed realization. 
It's not as an attempt from God, but as a guaranteed outcome of God. has been exposed. And the Greek word of because here is dia, which emphasizes the guarantee of that which God has done, because dia implies a successful transition completely through from one side to the other. And so God's intent in exposing his love and his mercy and his grace to us is effectual. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 36. Verse 5. Your loving kindness. This word here in Hebrew is chesed. It's translated as loving kindness or as graciousness or as mercy. So there's a few different translations you may see in your scriptures. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house. And you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your loving kindness to those who know you. And your righteousness to the upright in heart. Now the efficacy of that which Ephesians in this passage in Psalm details to us is not an efficacy that is resulting in universalism. This great love of God that is poured out upon humanity from the heavens down to the earth does not uh, ensure that all will be saved, that all will come to God, and that all of the sin within this world and this continual presence of sin within this world is all going to be wiped away one day and all will enter into reign with God forever. This is not the case. And we know this is not the case from many other passages of Scripture, but looking specifically at Ephesians and reflecting back on what we read in chapter 1, the call of God, the unique call of God, that which we need to respond to, those whom He has chosen. Um, it is detailed and outlined undeniably in this first chapter, and even when we look at chapter 2, verse 3, speaking of the wickedness of humanity, those haunting words at the end, even as the rest, which suggests that there are those who have not come yet to know Christ, and those of us who do know Christ were once in that boat, despite of what God has done for us. And so we need to understand this mercy and this love and this grace in the right respect, There is an effectual calling of Christ, absolutely. And there is a a definite need for individuals to accept that call of Christ. And this passage goes on here further to introduce and to explain that all that takes place here is because of God's grace. Verse 5, by grace you have been saved. And this grace, which is wonderfully intertwined in this text for grace, is that goodness of God that is received by man, not deserved by man, but given to man. It's giving us what we do not deserve. But this grace of God, this goodness that is received we do not deserve, is resulting from God's love, and yet the love of God we receive is a product of God's grace. It's a little bit confusing. It's God's love that gives us grace, and it's God's grace that gives us love. It's a little paradoxical in the reality of things, but nonetheless, it is absolutely true. Verse 5 says that it is all in grace, and in verse 8 and 9, we go on to read that, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. Salvation is, in fact, inarguably uh, by grace and by grace alone. 
And next week we will spend quite a bit more time unpacking what grace is and what we see in this text regarding grace. However, here this morning it is this mercy and love and grace that has come together on our behalf. And so let us look at what it says, verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, this mercy, this love, this grace of God made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive together with is one word in the Greek. In English, it's multiple words, but in the Greek, it's one word, and it's written in the aorist, in the past tense. It's happened already. But importantly, it's also written in the indicative. This is a fact. This is a fact. He has indeed, if you know Christ, he has made us alive together. Guarantee. It is in the active voice as well. This is fully an act of God. This is not middle voice or passive voice. God is doing this for us and towards us. And this is what this text details to us. We, we cannot argue it. If you want to argue it, when you get to heaven, you can talk to God about it. But, but this is what this text says. God has made us alive together with him. It is his work. It is his work alone. And it is a guaranteed work. And so we don't need to worry about that. This marvelous assertion declares the reality then of our union with Christ. It is a marvelous thing. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he has made us alive together with Christ. Speaking of the union, the joining of us into the family of God. This is the believer's salvation relationship. This is not just fellowship with other saints as we often think. Oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to reconnect with my loved ones, with my father, my parents, my sisters, my brothers, my friends. Yes, that's very true. There will be fellowship with the saints, but it's so much greater and deeper than that. It far surpasses that. This is to be partakers in Christ's death and in his resurrection and his ascension and to be seated with him in all eternity. This is the outcome of the interjection that but God towards those who call upon the name of Christ to be joint heirs, eternal fellowship with the king, part of that family. It's what we see at the end of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. As Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is this union with Christ that we have to look forward to. And Jesus also presents this with a marvelous picture that we find in the Gospels. And if you look at the Gospel of Luke quickly, chapter 15, starting in verse 17, you have the parable of the prodigal son. And Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of heaven. He's speaking about this union, this relationship, this salvation relationship. Those who were lost, living in sin, wayward, away from home, as they come back into the family of God, is detailed here. Verse 17, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This is indeed the pouring out of grace in our lives and upon our lives. This is the result of love and mercy that is spoken of here. This is seen in the cross, and this is seen in the resurrection. And this is realized in the heart of every true believer. This is what the scriptures testify to. But we need to back up a little here, and we need to look at a statement that flies off this page and in our face that gives us a greater and a deeper understanding of this love and mercy that God has blessed us with, that God has poured out on us. The first words we read in verse 5, even when. Man, even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we resembled that which we read of in the first three verses, and we looked at that pretty deeply, and it's a pretty disgusting picture, humanity without Christ. The depth of our depravity. But even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we were enemies to God, God affected this upon us and upon this world. This even when suggests despite. Despite us. Despite what we wanted, despite the direction we were going, despite all that's taken place in this world, because of his great love and his richness of mercy and his grace. Even when we were dead in sin, yet his love and mercy. And just to understand a little bit of the historical depth of that, you can flip back quickly, and we're going to try to do this fairly quickly, but we're going to look at a couple passages here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thought of every, every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. <coughs> And yet it says, even when, or despite this. Look at Exodus 32. Exodus 32, verse 6. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. And this is all in context to the golden calf. And this rose up to play isn't games of cards. It's not a soccer game that broke out. This is gross immorality. This word. This means they entered into abnormal relationships. Verse 14. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he had said he would do to his people as Moses intercedes on their behalf. Even in the midst of this, you know, this, this, this doesn't even make sense, what happens here. If you flip back a few pages, you're going to see what happens at Mount Sinai when the people come there. And as the whole company of people, the whole congregation of Israel, approaches the holy mountain, and they approach the holy mountain, let's remember, because all of a sudden there's a cloud that engulfs the mountain, there's flashes of lightning, there's a blazing, blaring trumpet of God, and the voice of God, and the shaking of the ground, calling the people. They know there is a God. If you're sitting here this morning and your faith rests only on what you've heard or what you've seen, what, you, what we're talking about here this morning, know this, the Israelites knew God. They were in the presence of God on that mountain. They knew if they touched the mountain, they would die. And what do they do when Moses is up there talking with God? This gross immorality, this idolatry. And yet God doesn't destroy them. And here in Ephesians, we see it again. Judges chapter 2. Verse 12. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed 
other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to the Lord. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 12. Or verse 18. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. And Luke, Luke chapter 5. Verse 32. Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. This really gives us insight into the depth or the true meaning of what love and mercy is. The purity and the heart of it. The extent of it. This passage really exposes two attributes then of the atonement. That's really what we're looking at here in Ephesians. Two aspects or attributes of God reflected within the atonement towards humanity. And so let's take a little quick or a quick look at this, a closer look at this here this morning. First, the exposure of God's love in this passage. And we've looked at a little bit of this already, but first we need to recognize that the love of God is clearly and authoritatively spoken here. At the end of verse 4 it says, with which he loved us. And that's important in this passage in regards to God's love. Because it's in this loved us that we find the indicative. That we find the factual statement applied to this act of God. He loved us. And that's important because many people want to deny God's love. They want to deny the fact that God's love could extend towards them. That they're somehow outside of that. But when we read this passage and we look at the state of humanity, and we read this declaration for us to say, well, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't include me or that doesn't include those people because they're, that's not who God's speaking about. That's, that's far outside of this. To deny this is to deny the authority then of the Scripture. We need to recognize first and foremost into this exposure of God's love that you are not out of reach of God's love. None of us are. And it's an odd thing to say or to look at, but Hitler was not out of the reach of God's love. Even after the atrocities. You're not out of the reach of God's love. Now in verse 5, as we looked at here, this even when statement triggers another passage, though, that we need to turn to and look at in regards to this love of God, this great love of God that has been afforded to us. This triggers another passage right away for me, and one that canonically appears five to six years before Ephesians is written. And so we know this revelation is given to Paul and to probably many, many others in regards to who God is and the love of God that is bestowed upon us. Turn to Romans. Romans chapter 5. Familiar passage, starting in verse 6. Parallels what we've been talking about here in Ephesians chapter 2. For while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies... While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. This is a wonderful passage that testifies 
the extent of God's love upon humanity, that which Ephesians is talking about. Reconciliation is at the heart of Romans 5, and reconciliation is at the heart of these passages, these verses in Ephesians 2. Really, it's talking about that alienation between humanity and God, that which is only and can only be restored by God. And this presents then an extreme manifestation towards us of God's love. Because reconciliation, we need to understand this, reconciliation or God's love that is shown through reconciliation deals alone with alienation with God by taking away our sin, not our subjective enmity. Not our hatred to God. This deals with our relationship with God. This deals with the fact that that we can now come before God. Or that God would even send His Son. Or that God would even allow any of it. Reconciliation is important. It deals with alienation, not enmity. You are reconciled with God through what what has happened on the cross. But we know for a fact that that hasn't changed the whole world's heart. We know for a fact that this took place long before we ever existed. Long before we ever accepted Christ. And this alienation has been paid for, has been dealt with by God. This is what Romans 5 is saying, and this is what Ephesians 2 is saying. Even when, even when you were a transgressor, even when you were an enemy of God, you were reconciled. It's important for us to know this. Because this further emphasizes the immensity of God's love towards us. That God would pay that price. That God would remove that alienation. Even when there was still hostility. And this just speaks to the sufficiency then, as well, of the atonement. The, the, The cross work of Christ covered the sins of this entire world. That which has happened in all eternity past, well, the beginning of the earth, and that which will happen again till till Christ returns. All of it has been covered. It's sufficient. It's enough. It is available to all. And without first laying aside or taking away our enmity, our hatred. A parallel passage to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 19, it says, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is a call to enter into the grace of God. To not remain alienated from God. And how do we do that? By realizing Jesus Christ. By accepting that marvelous gift provided by the atonement. And this is a choice that is afforded to humanity that is not available to humanity without God's great interjection. This is the peace that is available through this reconciliation. This is the specific act of the cross that it has historically declared. This is an accomplished fact. It's not an impending. Verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life 
And it's in this passage that deals with alienation, not removing our enmity, that also, though, ensures, ensures the removal of enmity towards and the laying aside of that enmity to those who come to Christ. That which Ephesians 1 talks about, those who are called, those who accept. Verse 6 to 7 details the atrocity of this situation. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The injustice of what God has done on our behalf. And yet he's done it willfully for us. And this is this great love that, that Ephesians chapter 2 is speaking of. This is this God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. That is being detailed here. It's unfathomable to us. Now, as a bit of a side note, it's also this passage that makes an amazingly good argument against atheism. Which are really because the argument is that humanity is out for its best interest and trying to uh, ensure its own life to be as prevalent and as successful as possible, and so we don't make choices that would change that course. The whole process of natural selection. And yet here we read clearly, and we see in Christ, and we see in humanity at times, those who sacrifice themselves. Well, that morality doesn't exist in a Darwinian philosophy, and that morality does not exist in an atheist position. That's for another discussion. Look at verse 10 here, just quickly, as we look at the process of this reconciliation. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Having been, verse 11, have now is the reconciliation that is effected by God and will be is the removal of enmity available by his life, again by God. So reconciliation is affected through this passage and salvation, that removal of enmity, that relationship with God, that fellowship with God is also by God. And again, this is his great love towards humanity and towards his children. And we see God's hand extended towards us, his perfect will towards the efficacy of his love that is poured out upon his children. And back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, at the end of that verse, we have this precursor for all the verses that come after it. It says, in love. For it was in love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace. And it goes on and on and on. All in love. In Ephesians 3.19, And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. That wonderful, inexplainable verse. To know that which you cannot know. This great love of God. In 1 John 4.10, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. In Romans 8.37-39, The greatness of God's love That nothing can take that away. As we come back to our text here this morning, in verse 4, this great love with which He loved us, it says. Which He loved us. And this declaration ultimately goes along with that but God, that interjection. Because it's this great love that corrected our course. Despite us, this great love acted on our behalf. And it's within this great love with which he loved us that a valuable truth is apparent. Love never does what you want or believe you need. True love 
does what is biblically right and good and at times aligns with what you want or need. That's important for us to understand. Love never does what you want or believe you need. True love does what is biblically right and good and at times aligns with what we want or need. And it's critical, again, to view it that way because if we look at it any other way, we run the risk of putting subjectivity before objectivity, becoming pragmatic instead of absolute. We need to be biblically driven and motivated in regards to love. And sometimes love is going to hurt. And sometimes love is going to not look like love in regards to the way the world presents it. Sometimes love is going to change somebody's course and change somebody's desires and change somebody's heart. Hebrews 12, 11 says that God disciplines us for our betterment and because of his love. Romans 12, 9 says to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Speaking of the purity of love. Hebrews 10.24 Consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Do you know what that word spur actually means in the Greek? It's proxusmos. Anybody that's had brothers and sisters knows proxusmos well. Very, very well. Because proxusmos means to provoke. It in fact means to provoke or to poke somebody so intently that it literally cuts them. You're jabbing them so much that it cuts them that it forces them to respond. It's pushing something hot into somebody until they go, ouch! This is this word used in proper context. Don't use this with your brothers and sisters. Speaking of love, consider how we may spur one another on. It's not a pretty picture. We look at it as oh, ex- exhortation or, or just you know, really encouraging somebody. And, oh, you know, if I give them enough good things, they'll, they'll fix their life. Well, maybe they need some good exhortation, but maybe they need a rebuke. Maybe they need to be pressed so much so that they bump out of the rut that they're in and they get back on track. It's this love for God and people that Jesus exemplified in Luke 19 when he went into the temple, turning over the money changers, with a cord, casting all these guys out of the house of God. He didn't cease being loving at that moment. I better speed up here. We need to move on to looking at this exposure of mercy that we see in the text here. There's this wonderful exposure of God's great love, but there's also an exposure of God's mercy here. For the text says, but God being rich in mercy. And it seemingly is understandably enough, pretty apparent or clear, God has a lot of mercy. But do we recognize that there is depth to this outside of our understanding of what this just means? If you look at Romans 11.32, it says that God has shut up all all humanity in disobedience so that, he sh- sh- that, so that he may show mercy to all. God's mercy is not a response to a perceived situation. God isn't merciful because man really made a mess of things. God isn't merciful just because we now somehow need it. Rather, mercy, the mercy of God is shown as an attribute of God, of that which is already pre-existent within God, that which has purposely been laid forth to declare the glorious nature of God, His greatness. God's always been merciful. And His will has gone forth to declare that mercy towards us. It is not a response. And the text here says, rich in mercy and rich is plusios which means to be fully resourced, not lacking in any possible way, to be abundantly supplied. Listen, folks, God will not run out of mercy. He will not run out of mercy. How so? Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. 
Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It's evermore his mercy. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. There is a universal experience to the mercy of God. Did you know that? Every human being that has ever existed has benefited from the mercy of God. 2 Samuel 24, 14, then David said to God, to Gad, I'm in great distress. Let's now fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. I'd rather fall to God, even his judgment, than to fall to man. Jeremiah 3.12, the declaration as an adjective of God, it's a defining feature of God. It says, for I am merciful. I am mercy, God is saying. I don't just do mercy. It's not just a verb. It's not just an action. I am mercy. Hebrews 4.16, Therefore let us draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Mercy is present at the throne of God. Back again to that great love that has removed that alienation. That through Christ we can come before God to receive this mercy. Psalm 103.17, But the loving kindness or the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And that should be a somewhat familiar verse because it's the same words that Mary describes in the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1 as she pours out her heart quoting Psalm. The Lord's great mercy, this child of God that has come to this world. Mercy defined in the scripture is that which comes from the Greek word elios, which means mercy. More so it speaks of goodwill towards those who are desperate and needy, but it is matched with a desire to do it. And it's interesting because the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, translates that word chesed that I said before, that loving kindness, that kind intention, to elios. And it does so 170 times. Which is interesting because the understood meaning of this mercy of God then is linked to the implication of chesed. And the implication of chesed reflects the covenant of God with his people. It speaks then to the covenant loyalty of God. Ultimately the will of God being fulfilled. His faithfulness and the assuredness of that fulfillment. This is the mercy of God. He's the covenant keeping God. And so how do we respond to this? It's a lot to take in, I know. Looking at the depth of God's love and his mercy towards us. And yet while we were sinners, this love that if you know Christ here this morning, you've experienced. Well, as we respond to this love, we need to first respond to it, love and mercy as a gift. Recognizing it as an undeserved extension of God's character towards us. And we need to just sit back for a while and just let that permeate. Consider that, the impact of that in our life, the magnitude of the revelation of God, his love and his mercy as a gift towards us. And as we marvel at that, as we meditate on that, it should cause this overwhelming necessity within us to cry out in worship. How can we be silent? Secondly, as we respond, love and mercy, we need to recognize it as the transformation that has taken place in our life, that which is exemplified in our lives through God's work. And this is big for Paul. This is maybe even arguably the main purpose of, of him placing some of this in here, or one of the purposes. Because if you remember at the introduction of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's writing to believers. He's writing to those who have already experienced this great love and this great mercy of God. He's dealing, detailing the doctrine to them, but he's reminding them. He's recalling their mind back to that transformation that has taken place in their life. Declaring positionally who they are in Christ and reminding them of that persuasion of God in their life. 
And as he does this, there's this call then to like-heartedness. That we are to reflect this then in our life. God loving us so much, how can we do any less to those around us? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God. And walk in love, verse 2. Just as Christ also loved you. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. In 1 Timothy 1.5, our love, our ministry is to come from a pure heart. We need to care about people rightly. Love is not about ease of position, but rather for the benefit of the individual, for the glory of God. So this should call us to recognize the greatness of God's love and mercy to realize the transformation in our life regarding love and mercy, and then to pour that out within our life. And we need to recognize that all of this is about God. God displaying His wonderful works, His marvelous plan, His unmistakable and humanly unattainable plan to reveal His glory to all the earth. And I was really happy with the songs that Rick chose this morning because... The closing verse as a benediction I had here this morning is Isaiah 6, verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank You so much for Your greatness, for Your goodness, for Your love and Your mercy and Your grace that has been bestowed upon us even when we were still sinners. Lord, help us to recognize that, to realize that, to give glory and honor to your name, to worship you in light of that, and help us to live our lives that way. May we stop living for the day, for whatever's happening around us, But may we commit ourselves to live in accordance to your word and to the glorious riches that are awaiting us. May all we do bring honor to you and be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.